are about to listen to a message from Root River Community Church. If you live in the Rushford, Minnesota area and do not have a church home, we would love to have you at one of our Sunday morning services. For more information about our church, visit our website at rootriver.org. We hope and pray that God speaks to you through this message. Today I want to share something that the Lord has shown me. It's nothing new to most of you, but to maybe somebody, it's something new. And uh, it's a message of freedom. It's a spiritual freedom, a freedom in Christ, and it's a pattern to get there. And um, I would just, let's just open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today for open ears. I pray for gentle yet strong words, words to penetrate the hardest of hearts and yet soft enough to soothe the hurting heart. I pray you will touch each of us through your word and that through it we will never be the same. Amen. So as I was wondering what to share this weekend, it's kind of like, you know, freedom is the obvious thing. It's the 4th of July. And I'm thinking, here's me. I don't want to do the obvious. <laughs> I want to do something different. And, but what? So then last week, of course, John Agramson, he's up here, right? And he preached on the very verse that we've been talking about at home, Colossians 1.13. And that was saying, you know, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And I'm kind of like, oh man, sounds like freedom. So I thought, well, maybe there's still something else. Lord, is there something else? Then this past week, I went to the movie The Patriot. And it's kind of like, well, it's the 4th of July. I can go to the movie Patriot, right? And, and so I went to that, and it's a movie set in the time of the Revolutionary War. And, and the, the, uh, the character, the lead character is Benjamin Martin. And he's a man that owns a plantation and has fought before and really wants to stay close to home. I mean, he wants to just take care of his family and live in that freedom. But he's drawn into the battle. And he, made it, he said a quote in the movie that I won't forget. And he says, once you taste freedom you will never be the same. And it's kind of, oh, no, again, the freedom talk. I'm still thinking there has to be something different to talk about on Sunday, right? Then came, and I remembered the poll. You know what the poll is. That's those informal things that I do at home with my family and my friends. I take these polls. And so I had taken a poll a few months ago, and I asked my family, and I asked friends, and I said, what do you think the message that the church needs to hear more than anything. And when I say church, again, I say the big church, not just the local church, but yet it can mean the local church. And it was resounding, you know, it's freedom. It, it's, it's the message of freedom. It's that, that, that free to live, that freedom to be a new creation. That's what the message needs to be. And so for lack of a better thing to do, I'm going to talk about freedom. Because when God wanted a message spoken, he said it through John. He said it through the movie. He said it through me remembering the poll that we had. And that's what it's about, and it just happens to be the 4th of July. So I'm going to put the title of the message is The Four R's in the Journey Towards Restoration. We're going to be looking at four R words towards a restored life. We're going to be looking at recognizing, repenting, receiving, and restoration. And our text I'd like to look at is 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 7, and then verse 13. So if you have your Bible, why don't you open it up? The setting is after David's adulterous affair and his murder of Uriah the Hittite. And, and so there's a period of time that has, has gone on here because when, when we see at the end of chapter 11, it says, and she bore him a son, meaning, wow, we've got about nine months here, almost a year as, as the setting of 2 Samuel 12 comes. And this is what it says. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He had raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or his cattle to prepare for a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. There's a period of, there's some more verses here that go that, that Nathan explains how David hasn't been content with what the Lord has done. And then we get down to verse 13. 
And then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, so I want to take a little time. I love this Nathan and David exchange. I mean, if you've been in my family, we do these round table things at the mealtime. So every once in a while, we'll just come up with something and say, I want to talk about this. And so we've talked about this, <coughs> excuse me, Nathan and David uh, exchange many times. But I'm looking at it and it establishes a pattern for us towards a restored life. The first R we're going to look at is recognize. And recognize is that ability to admit, to validate, to acknowledge. It's saying, I own this. As the story Nathan told and pulled it before David, you know, David became enraged. And he's probably thinking, who is this? Who is this little prophet coming to me? I'm the king. Don't you know that I have the power of life and death in my hands? Who are you? But he hears him out. So I wonder in my head, since nine months to almost a year had gone on, since this, this adulterous thing with Bathsheba and, and uh, Uriah, I'm wondering, had David become so insensitive over that time period that he didn't see himself in this picture? In the story that Nathan said, was he, did he miss seeing himself? Was this, was it, I, I think of this, his harp is probably in the corner, untuned and dusty. You know, the pen for his psalm writing is probably in the, in the desk, uh, if he had a desk. But it, it probably, his relationship and his fellowship with God was probably just a little set back, do you think? Because he just, he wasn't in tune. Um, at, at the end of that, Nathan, you know, he says to David, you're that man. At that time, Nathan has two options. He can either ignore it and say, away with him, or he can recognize it. And that's where this R comes from. He can recognize and say, I'm it. I am that man. So J David chose at that time to recognize it and to take ownership of it. Now, I know we've all had a Nathan in our life. I've had one. I mean, I've had that person that comes up and says, hey, do you see what you're doing? And at that particular time, we have the same thing. We can say, no, I, I don't see it. Or we can say, all right, I get it. I, I, I see this. And the period of time, I mean, just because we ignore it, this doesn't go away. I mean, it still is there. In David's case, a period of nine months or a year, it went on, but the sin was still there. The consequence of it was still there. So I like to think of it as the story of the potter and the clay. You know, the potter can design and make the clay into anything that he wants, right? And, and if we are the clay and we're remaining in the potter's hand, he he's, wants to form us into that bowl and we're kind of, no, 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 I want to be a cup. I want to be more useful. I do not want to be the bowl. The potter's kind of, no, no, you need to be the bowl. But instead, we fight and we squirm and we do this, and so the potter takes it and he sets it on the shelf. He goes, okay, stay there for a little bit. Well, what happens when you take clay off the potter's wheel and set it on the shelf? It starts to get hard. Potter comes back later and picks it up and he puts it back down and he goes, okay, I want you to be a bowl. Let's reform you. And he starts to work and work. And what happens after you've started to get dry? It hurts. And it's kind of, oh no, this is beginning to be painful and hurt. And God, in his wisdom and in his love and his grace, his mercy, is just kind of, I see what you need to be. I need how, and see how you can be useful. And we sit and we fight. And so that's how I see it. It's kind of either we ignore it or we recognize it and we allow him to shape us and form us into who he wants. Um, the second R, if we can recognize this, we're going to lead to an area of repentance. And, and we know that repentance is to change one's mind, it's to turn from sin, and it's to return to God. That's really the simple, easy definition. It's changing our mind, it's turning away, and it's turning back to God. And, and so we know the true repentance in David's case because Psalm 51 was penned after this, this exchange with Nathan. And you can look at that just a little bit. In 51.3, it says, For I knew my transgressions. 51.4 says, Because against you and you alone have I sinned. 51.10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. 51.12, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. 51.15 says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth that I will declare your praise. We're seeing that we're seeing a pattern of repentance knowing that we've sinned and who we've sinned against, desiring a cleansed heart and wanting the rest of restoring joy and declaring his peace. David knew the path to repentance. 
He knew that it started with recognizing what Nathan challenged him with. He knew that as he recognized this, that he needed to go before the Lord and he needed to repent. And we're seeing a pattern. You know, the thing of repentance is this. It's a null and void thing. If you don't see the first R of recognizing, you don't have to repent. We talk about that as a family, as kids. It's kind of, if you don't see what you're doing is wrong, what do you have to repent from, right? So in David's state for that period of time, he's kind of like, I, I don't see anything wrong. There was nothing there. I mean, it, his, his box was empty. He was, he was just kind of like, I, I, don't, I don't get it. But as Nathan came and recognized it, now he goes, I need to repent. That doesn't relieve if we don't accept that we recognize it. It doesn't relieve the consequence of the sin because the sin and the consequence is always there. But with the Lord, it gives us that opportunity to be able to handle things, to be able to walk through the issues. A couple of years ago, a man, uh, a man at a Bible study, a gentleman asked a question. And he asked the question, he said, do you think that things are sin for some men and not for others? And if you know me, you know that this question has rolled in my head for at least two years. It has just continued to just, I don't understand. it. And so I started to think, you know, it's not the way I was looking. I was looking at it as preferences, to dance or not to dance, to wear pants, to wear a dress, to, to listen to country music, to listen to hip hop, whatever it was. But it was when I really looked at the question again, it was kind of like, do you think there's sin for some men and not sin for others. And I'm kind of, I'm looking at the wrong question. I'm looking at the wrong word. The word I should be looking at is sin, right? Sin is clearly defined in Scripture. In a biblical perspective, it's missing the mark. And so this rolling in my head for two years, and I'm sorry if you all sat and had coffee with me because it continued to be there, that it was kind of like, Lord, what are you trying to show me through this? And it was kind of not to get distracted on the small things, although they are important because of the motive behind but it's really the foundation of sin in our heart before the Lord that we need to address, that we need to address. And because not sin isn't okay with God, it shouldn't be okay with us. And if we're tolerating it and we're feeding that dog, you need to stop. And that's where we're at. And I've been there in my life, and maybe there's some people in here too that were feeding that sin. And we're saying, no, 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 that's your idea, this is my idea. The Bible clearly states what sin is and what it is not. Um, we don't lessen that view, but if we do, we feel like there's not that need to repent. But we need to go back to recognizing, to repenting it. And then the, what I'm saying is, <laughs> if you don't recognize it, and you don't recognize it, there's, there's, you repent from it, there's nothing you can do. There's absolutely no more things to do. Your game's over. And so it all begins back, and so it's an inductive thing. If you've gone to the studies, inductive studies say step one, Step two, step three, step four. So they all build on one another. We're going we're gonna to look at that third R, and that's to receive. Receive is to be given, presented with, to take into one's possession. The R of receiving forgiveness. It's a total cleansing of wrongs done. Forgiveness from a holy God to a sinful man. David said it in 51.14, Psalm 51.14, Save me from my blood guilt, O God. The God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. It's a vow of a forgiven sinner to a holy God. And again, you're seeing what is happening. We recognize the sin, repenting from it, and now we're receiving the forgiveness from God. You know, I worked at a drug facility and a rehabilitation place, and I spoke to and this very thing in a class. And I, and I laid it out the same way. I'm saying, hey, guys, there's, a, re there's a, a recognizing sin, there's repenting from sin, there's a receiving sin, and then we're going to get into a restored life. And I said, which one is the hardest for you? Oh, definitely receiving. I said, why is that? Why is that the hardest one? They said, because Jim, you don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the things that I've seen. You don't know the thoughts that I have. So they have put themselves in this, I am not worth it. And I'm kind of like, but the Bible talks about it, that we all have sinned. None of us are worth anything. But in his goodness and his mercy and his grace, he, he died, he rose, and he paid the penalty, or he paid the price for our penalty. This is the hardest thing for them to grasp. And the guys there, they, they literally, they looked and they just kind of like, I can't go on. I don't know how to receive the forgiveness. I can recognize it. I can even say, I'm sorry, and I can repent from it. But for them to feel the overwhelming forgiveness from the Lord was something that was, was difficult for them to grasp because in our humanness, we continue to make this box. 
and we continue to want to put God in that box that fits. We're creating that and going, no, no, my God can't do that. Okay, your God probably can't, but the God of Scripture can. That is the God that we that we look at. First uh, John one nine says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Hebrews ten seventeen says. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. So what a comfort to know that our sins will be be remembered no more. God forgives completely. There's no need to continue to go over the same ground before. You know, we, we continue to feel comfortable in our past. And so we continue to say, well, I must ask for forgiveness. I must. It's been done. Receive the forgiveness totally. They're gone. And that's what a gift. We have a hard time accepting that. But once we can receive the forgiveness the Lord offers us, I mean, once we can grasp total forgiveness that he offers, we can begin to live a restored life. And and so as we look at that, restored means to bring back, to bring back, to return to a former condition. A restored life is what David desired. Again, in Psalm 51, 12, he states, restore me to the joy of your salvation. It's going back to your first law. It's not forsaking it. It's not leaving it. It's not forgetting it. It's being restored to your first love and that joy of that salvation. Have you ever had an old piece of furniture and you saw potential in it? There's this, you go to a garage sale or you go to an estate sale and there's this piece of furniture and you're looking and saying, I think this thing has potential. I think it's really old. I think it's antique like. And you're looking at it and going like, it's got a lot of old paint on it. It's got like scuffs on it. It's got nails in it. I mean, it's got stuff. So you take it and you, and you take it home and you're looking at it because no one else wanted it. And you start to remove the paint one layer at a time. You start to fill in the cracks. You start to remove the nail hole, you know, the nails. You fill in the nail holes and you start to look at it and you go, wow, I'm bringing it back to its original condition. That's what restoration does. It brings us back to our life back to pre-bad decisions. It brings us back to pre-consequence. It brings us back to the way God intended. No longer do we have to live in guilt. No longer do we have to live in bondage, right? We can live a restored life that's filled with hope. If we have no hope, what do we have? We, We have only the things that we have made. We have only the things that we have created. We have only the things that we are comfortable with. But God says, no, follow the pattern. Throughout scripture, there's a number of patterns. There was the pattern now that we see between David and Nathan that says, he comes, I recognize. As we recognize, we repent. As we repent, we receive the forgiveness God offers. And as we receive forgiveness, now we can live a restored life. It's the final piece of the pattern that that going back to the first quote of the movie, once you taste freedom, you will never be the same. And so we, we grasp it and we love it. Once we see Jesus, we should never be the same. I think back to last Sunday evening, and we had a Little Feet concert. Well, maybe you're here for a Little Feet concert. I mean, did you walk out of here the same? You couldn't. I mean, you walk out and you just feel, wow, what was these guys that were no taller than my knee, what was their motive and where was their heart? How did they have this genuine love, this genuine worship? It was so real. It was so heartfelt. I talked to a gentleman here, and, and the gentleman said, he said, you know, if you walked out of that, I wonder if you had a pulse. Because it was just that impacting. And I'm thinking, these little guys, and these little gals, they must have seen Jesus. They must have seen Jesus, because they are not the same as they were when they came nine months ago. If you had a chance to talk to the sponsors, they're kind of, oh, here's what, you know, this little girl was like when she came. Here's what she's like now. She saw Jesus, and she was totally different. That's how we're to be. We need to know what, being, we, what we're being freed from and what we're being freed to. Sometimes we're being freed from slavery of sin to the freedom of Christ. Jeff mentioned that today. It's the freedom of Christ. That's what it's about. We're being freed from darkness to light. We're being freed from guilt to total forgiveness. We're being freed from the power of Satan to the power of God. Now, who doesn't want to live like that? I mean, who doesn't want to live in freedom? I mean, this is what we say. Jeff had alluded to it. It's kind of, we have so many freedoms here. But you know what I think we're missing? The freedom of the Word of God. 
We're, getting, we're missing the power that he has that says no longer are you a slave to sin. No longer are you a slave to guilt. Guilt is that paralyzing emotion that you can sit in the chair and just there. And I don't know what to do. I, I'm not worth anything. And, it, and it, it paralyzes us. And that's where Satan wants it. He wants you in a, a paralyzed state. When God says, no longer do you live like that, you live like a free man, you live like a free woman, you live like a free church. You live like a, 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 I love what God's doing in this church. This is phenomenal. The last two and three weeks of bringing the people in, seeing the children sing, celebrating the fourth, we are living in a time where God is just shaking us upside down and he's kind of like, I have so much more for you. There's a, um, there's a story. There's a, I've shared this with a few men too. There's a, there's a video. It's called The Gospel. It's an 11-minute video. And maybe someday we'll be able to see it here depending on you know, if Mike has time sometime. But there's a, there's a part in this little film, this little uh, video that a man is in prison and he's sitting against the wall and his hands are, are, chast, are uh, shackled and he's sitting there and someone walks in, intercessor walks in and says, you're free. The chains fall off and he stands up and he's praising God in his prison cell and he is so excited because he is praising God and he is free. And then there's a voice in the back of the video that says, uh, uh, you're free to leave. Would you check the door? The door is open. And when you walk through the door, there is a whole new life that's waiting in freedom that we just can't imagine, that we can't get to the point of receiving that total forgiveness. We'll accept God, and we'll accept Christ into our life, but we're going to stay in the prison cell. So what he's saying is, try the door. It's open. And so to me... It is, it is the most impactful thing, 11 minutes I've seen. It is the most impactful video that I've seen that says, I don't have to live free in prison. I'm free to live outside. And, and there's so much more to it, but it, it's phenomenal. Back to the freedom as we look back to July 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. You know, we didn't just become free because of our declaration. Hey, we're a free country from England. Thank you very much. You know what, when we made the declaration, the battle began. That's when it started to happen. Because it was a few years later when we finally were able to gather our full independence from England. Some people in this room, I did it one time in my life, made the declaration, I'm following Christ. But you know what? I didn't, I didn't battle. I didn't enter the fray. I didn't go and do and be the person God wanted me to be. I claimed it. I declared it but it wasn't enough. Our Christian life begins only with the declaration, but it's not the place to just stand still. I'm the visual guy, remember? The escalator, there's an escalator and it's a down escalator and it's pulling us backwards. And I always have heaven here and I always have hell here. But the escalator is constantly pulling us backwards. When we first become a Christian, we are so excited and we run. And we are running on this up this down escalator, and we're making progress. progress. And all of a sudden, we're, we look and we can't, okay, I'm a, I'm a little, I'll start to walk. Because we get a little tired. We can't run forever, right? So we walk. But we're still making some progress. Then we go, wow, look at where I'm at. When we start to look at where we're at, we don't walk anymore. What happens when you're on a down escalator and you stand still? You go backwards. All of a sudden, you're here, and you look and you go, how did I end up back here? And it's that complacency in our life. It is that living in a place of freedom without really knowing what freedom is. It's not just being able to do everything that we want, but it's being able to do the things that we ought. And that's what's phenomenal. And so look at those things. Ignoring the problem doesn't make it only grow away. It increases the pain when eventually we have to deal with it. Um, let's recognize the things early. There was a roving reporter who stopped a man on the street one day and he said, do you know what the two biggest problems in America are? The pedestrian looked at him and he says, I don't know and I don't care. The reporter said, you have them both. That's it. He's identifying the problems and the guy's kind of, I don't know and I don't care. Yeah, you've got them both. Sometimes that's us in our Christian life. 
we don't want to recognize it, we don't want to see it. So it's, 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 we need to truly see what it is because the consequence of choices made don't go away. They only magnify. So it's best to take out that weed early. Um, we'll invite the worship team back up here. We're going to sing one closing song here. It's Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. You know, you start thinking some songs and the Psalms in David's case were born from pain, the pain of sin. And Amazing Grace was a song that was born out of a life that was radically changed. You know, John Newton, he was a captain of a slave ship. He was a radically transformed man of God. Later in his life, Newton says, I remembered two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. A life of disgrace was turned into a baby. You just listened to a message from Root River Community Church. For more information about our church or how to make Jesus the Lord of your life, visit our website at rootriver.org.